Let us begin this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Oh. I just would like to say thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your hospitality. You have been so gracious already, and that means so much to me. Um, and I'm also so excited that it's Good Shepherd Sunday. I got to see some sheep. <laughs> where, where I come from, we don't have sheep. And I got to count some, is it group 9 or 9G? I, I get confused. Um, 9G. 9G? Okay. I saw them. <laughs> oh, it's was great. Um, so, Good Shepherd Sunday. The text that we heard today in the Gospel of John is such a powerful text because it not only touched the hearts of the people in the first century, but, but it touches us today. It is really challenging us in how we live out our discipleship. But the scene, John is brilliant with this. It is winter. You can feel the atmosphere. And Jesus is walking along into the portico of Solomon by the, the large temple. And, and I always think of him as sort of being cold, you know, that wind that comes through in the winter in Jerusalem. And he's probably seeking Warmth. And what is he confronted with? The authorities. And they come to him and they ask him a question. Are you the Messiah? Tell us. Now, why are they asking that question at that point? What does it say at the beginning? It is the Feast of the Dedication. Do you know what that is? Does anyone know what it is? It's Hanukkah. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, this is the only place in the Bible where Hanukkah is mentioned. And it's in the Gospel of John. <laughs> so, Think about Hanukkah. Do you remember the story? I get, I, actually, I, I confess, I get a little confused with all the history of it. But in a nutshell, okay, in a nutshell, there is, that's when the Greeks have come in, and Antiochus is the ruler. It's about 167 BCE, and Antiochus is trying to get all the Jewish people to be uniformed, and so he takes away their rights, he desecrates which is, of course, the most sacred space for the Jewish people. I mean, this is the worst thing that could happen to them. And there's a revolt. Judas Maccabee and his brothers and his family, and they come down, and there's a little bit of a war, and they recapture Jerusalem. They get the temple back, and, and what's the story is about the oil. Do you remember? And that's why they like the menorah now, is because they only had enough oil for one day until they could form or create sacred oil that would take seven more days. And the oil lasted. The oil lasted. And it was a sign from God. Had Sonica. <laughs> so here now, in Jesus' time, are the authorities who are living under the oppression of the Romans. Same thing. Not that they're defiling 
the temple, but it's the same situation of oppression. Are we going to be free? Are we going to be again the great nation that God has called us to be? And so the question to Jesus is, are you the Messiah? Are you the one who's going to help us be victorious? Are you going to help us win back our land? Be another military genius? And Jesus is like, oh, guys, I keep trying to tell you, and you're not listening. That's not who I am. And then he's almost insulting because he refers to himself as the good shepherd. Do you know anything about shepherds in Jesus' time? Okay, they, they were around when he was born. Remember the, the shepherds of the, the nativity scene? But shepherds in that time were, I'm sorry to do this to you, Mike, but, you know, <laughs> um, but, but they were outcasts. It was like Jesus going up and saying, I am an migrant worker. I am an, an you know, illegal uh, alien. I mean, that's what he's saying. He is aligning himself with the very people that are on the fringes. And you want to say, the, for the people of the authorities, are they like, crazy? How are we ever going to have victory again? If this is what you do, if this is what you align yourself with, That Jesus' vision, which is the Father's vision, which is a vision of a kingdom of God where all are welcomed. And the power is assessed not by military strength or money or status, but because you are God's. I, I struggle with it today. I mean, I'm much more comfortable thinking that I am part of, you know, an educated class, working, I mean, all those things. I want to be part of the people who have power and prestige and influence. Don't we? Don't we think that's how we get things done? And yet Jesus is calling us to look at that in our hearts. What do you mean? What does it mean to be part of this flock? And it's even more challenging today, I think. The world is crazy. Have you noticed that? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's crazy. Global secular, would you say? Have you seen that here? But the power when we do strive to do this kind of work is so transformative. When we can get out of ourselves and, and do things that make us realize that our power comes in love and grace. Yesterday I was reading the New York Times. Did you read about the Pope? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? And he took 12 Syrian refugees. And I know your bishop, Andy Geechee, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Has asked for your diocese to look at this issue of refugee resettlement. I am in my church down in Connecticut. Has anyone been to Connecticut? It's really not that far away. <laughs> <laughs> But no sheep, but it's really nice then. Um, I 
my church is part of an interfaith group called REACT. And we decided that we were going to once again get involved in refugee resettlement. We had done it six years prior. We had an Iraqi family come. And I'm going to tell you, I'll be perfectly honest, it is hard. It is very, very hard work. As you know, these so many, so many refugees that we home. And we're working with a group called IRIS which is Integrated Refugee Immigration Services. It is not ISIS, okay? I just <laughs> want to clarify that. IRIS. And we've been working with them. I'm sort of a chaplain to this group that we call WEAC, which is Wilton Interfaith Group. And so we decided to make this big decision that we're going to take a refugee family. We got ready. It's getting housing and ESL and transfer. I mean, it's, it's a massive project. And you need lots of people to do it. And then we get a call from Iris saying, we have a family for you. Manal. She is 33 years old and a widow. Her education is maybe eighth grade, maybe. She's been living in the camps for two years. She's been vetted. And she is bringing with her five children. Muhammad is 12. Bisan, the only girl, is 11. Ahmed is 9. Yaqub, 5. And the baby, Gaith, is 2. We get this information and we went, are you kidding us? Five children. Does anyone here have five children? Do you really? I'm going to call you. <laughs> five children. So we gathered to decide, should we do this? Should we take this family? Is this the best choice for her and her children? Can we do this work? And finally, after a night of prayer and discernment, we said yes. I got to go down to JFK on March 10th as they arrived. And they came, and I have to tell you, it was very calm, very peaceful. Manal was there with these five children. I was the one running around trying to say hello in Syrian Arabic. I don't think I was very successful because these kids looked at me like, what is she saying? And the transfer between immigration and us was very smooth. It's one, two, three. We had two interpreters, Samir and Naveed, his wife, his, his wife. And we left that airport. And we got into a minivan. And it was Samir and Naveed in the front, Banal, her five children, and all of her earthly possessions. And they fit in one minivan. Can, can we imagine doing that? Could we fit everything into one minivan? We got back to Wilton and we helped her get settled and there was lots of going on. And finally it was time to leave. I was the last one to leave and I was putting on my shoes because the custom is when you go into a, a Muslim household, you take your shoes off. And I'm bending down trying to do it and I looked up and Manal was standing there. She looked me right in the eye and she said in English, thank you. I love you. And what I saw in her eyes was hope. That's our job. Our job is to bring 
to each other during our tough times, to those we encounter, to those who feel like they are outcast. We are to bring that joy and that hope to people that might not hear from anyone else. And to share that love of the risen Christ. Because when we do that kind of work, we are transformed as much as they are. It is in that neutrality that God's kingdom is going to be realized. And we can change this world to be a better place. So follow him, this good shepherd. Be faithful. And be people of the risen Lord who brings hope. Even in those places that might even seem dark. Because the light of Christ is there. Amen. Amen.